everyone. It's Jennifer Van Alstyne here on the Social Academic Blog, YouTube channel, and podcast. We're here talking with Dr. Tulio Rossi, Director of Animate Your Science. I'm so excited to have this conversation today because having some kind of visual or video or animation can make a really big difference for sharing your research. Tulio, welcome to the Social Academic. Would you mind starting us off by introducing yourself? Hi, Jennifer. Uh, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So I'll give you a little bit of a background about myself. So um, I would say everything started when I was still a teenager and I started playing around, around with graphic design. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for years, I made uh, flyers and posters for events because my best friend uh, organized events. So one day we thought, hmm, why don't we make a flyer for the next event? And it was a lot of fun. Uh, and I always considered it as a bit of a plan B career, if you like, uh, because then I went on and pursued a career in marine biology. And so that was back in Italy, my home country, the undergrad, a master's degree, and then a PhD, which brought me here in Australia, where I currently live. And I was doing that PhD when I realized that actually science really needs some help from the world of graphic design and communication in general because there's so much great research published in these peer-reviewed articles which nobody gets to hear about mm. often not even the researchers themselves um, so that pushed me to try things uh, that not many others were, were even considering to figure out a way on how can we make sure that this research we publish is noticed and it's not just lost in this giant online repository of papers. Um, so the question is, how do we make sure that our research stands out? And so th that led me on, on a new journey. And I experimented with scientific posters, with graphical abstracts and video animations. That's amazing. And I actually watched one of your early videos about your own research. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So my research was about the effect of climate change on fish and the ocean in general. And, you know, the, it's a kind of a research that has absolutely no um, commercial application whatsoever. Um, the only point of that research is to let the public know what we risk if we don't address our climate change problem. And so the, I concluded that I really needed to get this research out in some way. Um, and so I read a lot about storytelling and I found that um, whiteboard animation are actually within reach to everyone. You know, I, I'm not trained as an animator. Uh, I used to be a graphic designer, yes, but I'm not an animator. But anybody can actually make a whiteboard animation, turns out, because there is um, a, a number of fairly user-friendly software out there that have very extensive libraries of drawings and assets that you can just use. And so that I figured out, okay, I actually can put together an animation myself with my budget was what $30 <laughs> <laughs> which was like a one month of license to this software I used and so I decided to try it. and I what I think what really made the difference is that I told about the research in a way that didn't feel like a lecture but in a way that felt like a story and that makes all the difference really so I started the video like um, imagine to be a baby fish, uh, you know, and, and that really draw people in. And I had the opportunity to observe people watch my video. And I could see emotions on their faces. And I was like, yes, that's the holy grail of communication is when you make people feel something. And so that video worked really well. And it was seen by thousands around the world. It won prizes in science communication. And they even got me an email from a stranger saying, oh, I finally understand what this thing is, um, what the problem is with this thing called ocean acidification. Thank you for making that video. And I was like, all right. I think nobody ever told me thank you before <laughs> for doing the work I was doing. I was like, that feels good. And so the world is not just made of angry climate change deniers. There are also nice people out there that will show signs of gratitude if us researchers do that little extra effort to break it down in a simple and accessible way 
for everyone. So that, that was really a great experience. Um, and then what happened is that I presented this work at a scientific conference and the feedback from other researchers was really good. They, a lot of them came after my talk and said, oh, I love what you did. I wish I could do the same. I just don't know how to do it or I don't have the time. Mm-hmm. And so that turned on a light bulb in my head thinking, hmm, I should take this more seriously and perhaps I can even make a career out of this. And so that started a new part of my life, of my career into science communication and led to where I am today, which is um, uh, leading Animate Your Science, um, science communication agency that is privileged to help researchers and institutions from all around the world, literally all continents, um, to communicate science using tools like animation videos, um, graphical abstracts, posters, infographics, and we also offer training. So either we do it for you uh, if you're busy, uh, but if you have the time, we actually can also teach you some skills. I think that's amazing. And that really helps anyone who needs this kind of skill in their life, whether it's having it done for you or getting help to learn how to do it yourself. I think that um, I just, what you were talking about um, in terms of being able to see the emotions of people who watched um, your video, the very first video you created about this. I wish you'd seen me watching it. I was, I was like crying by the end. And I remember going to my fiance and being like, you know how much we care about sustainable fishing. Let me tell you about this video that I just watched and how important it is um, for us to understand our oceans, how to understand um, what climate change is affecting and, and, and what we can, what we can start to share about it. Um, this video affected me so much that I was already telling people about it within just a few minutes of having watched it myself. And I just think that that kind of excitement, that kind of emotional impact that that video had on me just goes to show how important a company like yours is, how important the work that you're doing to help other researchers and scientists communicate their work to the general public, but also to other researchers who can benefit from it. It's amazing. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm very, very happy to hear that it touched you. Uh, that, <laughs> that's always the, the jackpot of communication, is reaching people, not just at the brain level, mm. but way deeper down here in the heart. Yeah, exactly. uh, and when that happens, it, it's, which is not easy, uh, you really hit the jackpot in communication. <laughs> For sure. Now, tell me, we, we've been talking about a little bit about video, but you're also amazing at graphical abstracts, and that's something that you help scientists with. What is a graphical abstract? Sure. So when I started um, this new part of my career in, in, in business, I looked around of what was out there in terms of graphical abstracts, and I realized that pretty much none of what was out there was actually suitable if you wanted to communicate your research to a non-expert audience. So if you want to reach the general public with your graphical abstract, none of what was out there would work. All the graphical abstract we used to see uh, are very technical. Uh, They are straight to the the key process. Uh, Let's say molecule A meets molecule B. They have a reaction to, to create this new molecule. That's pretty much what they look like. Um, some in the field of uh, medical field, they even go as far as having p-values, which definitely would mean nothing to a non-expert. So looking at that, uh, you know, my interest uh, and vision was really to bring science to society, not just to other experts. So I wanted to create something that will go beyond um, the, the, the expert um, sphere. So I created a new format of graphical abstract, which is a little bit more wordy. I limited it to 80 words, uh, but it has the advantage that it gives some context. It tells the story of, of that research. So in 80 words, I figured it was enough to just touch on a little bit of background, highlighting what the knowledge gap or the question that the research is asking, uh, providing the key results, not all the results, of course, just the key result and why that matters. Um, can be done in 80 words. I'm not saying it's easy, but it can be done. Um, and the rest are visuals. So whatever visuals are relevant to the research, the, the rest needs to be visual. So because the reality is that people 
process images way, way faster than they process text. That's why we have um, strict signs that are not worthy. You know, they don't explain things with words, they explain with iconography. The same applies to your graphical abstract. The more visual it is, the, the more rapidly the, the viewer will be able to understand it. So by so limiting that, that, the words, you're really able to communicate through both words and visuals what the story is in that graphical abstract, it sounds like. Yeah, so I, I think with, with this balance between words and visuals, you can really reach anybody. And so then you've got a much wider audience and they'll, they'll, at the end of reading it, they'll be able to decide whether they want to go and read the actual paper great, that might be your goal, or just to understand what the key message is and then move on. But they can still then share it on social media with their friends, um, which is still a very important thing. So it, it really extends the, the potential impact of the research massively. That's great. So it sounds like once you have this graphical abstract, it's something that you can share on social media. That must really help scientists to reach more people. Absolutely. So we're seeing a, a great use case for graphical abstract is social media. I would say Twitter above all. Um, the, the wrong approach, uh, which I still see very often, is to say, hey, I published a new paper. And you pop the link to the paper and that's it. Um, well, that's a tweet that goes un unnoticed because it's not visual. It's just a string of text. Some researchers then screenshot one of the figures, maybe the prettiest figure, uh, and they pop it in there. That's a little bit better, but still people don't want to see charts on Twitter. Uh, they want kind to of see a figure them. out of context too, if you don't necessarily and yeah, exactly. have access and it's to often that out of right context. <laughs> so people will struggle to make sense of it. Uh, so here is where the graphical abstract really helps. Um, so in one panel, you can flesh out that key story and attract people with, with visuals. That's amazing. And I then, think the, the thing I really like about it is that it can be shared on its own and in conjunction with the paper. So it's okay if people are only connecting with the graphical part of it. They don't necessarily need to read the paper to be able to share it. That just really increases the, the impact. Do you, do you have any stats about that in terms of uh, like how much impact it can make for a paper? Sure. So there's actually really interesting research from the field of surgery, which I'm going to read out to you. So this is a study published in the Annals of Surgery in 2017. The author is uh, Ibrahim and colleagues. So he, they, they compare um, the, how effective it is to tweet about your research with or without a graphical abstract. Um, still consider these are fairly technical graphical abstracts, so not those uh, uh, that I was describing, but even with the technical one, here's what they found. The reach, so how many people will see it on Twitter, almost eight times as high. Wow. Number of retweets, so how many people share it, more than eight times as high. And article visits, so how many people actually click and go and read your paper, almost three times as high. Wow. So this is pretty amazing, isn't it? Like the, 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 it's like day and night. Yeah. So yeah. I think it should become the standard that if when you publish a paper and you want to share it on Twitter or any other social media, it needs to have a, a graphical abstract. Mm. It, it will be a massive lost opportunity if you don't, in my view. Yeah, it sounds like if we're seeing those kinds of numbers with the kind of really technical graphical abstract, having something from you or something that really just communicates more effectively to the general public can even increase that potential reach even more. That that potential for retweeting, if if you don't understand what is going on in the abstract, it, it's going to go down. But once you have that really connection, that, that connection that helps you not only understand, but know why it might be helpful for other people to see it too. That's what increases that potential for sharing. So I just love that.
Now, what's the difference between a graphical abstract and a scientific poster? I mean, I'm in, in the humanities. I think I've done one, one poster about my research and it wasn't very good. So what is a, a scientific poster versus a graphical abstract? Sure. So in my view, they are actually very similar. Mm. The key difference is just the size. Okay. Um, graphical abstract is typically something that needs to fit in a tweet mm -hmm. on social media. Um, so as I said, I would not write more than 80 words and have one or two key visuals. On a poster, you have much more real estate. Typically, if it's printed on an A0 format, which is very large. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have plenty more real estate. But having all that real estate uh, often leads researchers to make the most common mistake, which is to dump everything they've got on it. So they dump a couple thousand words. They dump yeah. not one chart, maybe eight, <laughs> and a couple of tables too. Um, and then the whole thing becomes this wall of text and chart that is just overwhelming for the audience. So that's the key problem of posters. And one of my battles is to change that. Because if we design posters this way, we're just giving, um, creating a disservice to ourselves and our audience. These posters are ineffective because they put people off, literally. If something looks overwhelming, you don't want to look at it. Think about the, the typical poster session pre-corona. You know, the end of the day, you get your first glass of wine, you're starting to relax, and you go around and look at posters. Do you really want to read for half an hour, 2,000 words, and process eight complicated charts? I don't think so. <laughs> What you want is to have a conversation with the, pe the person presenting that poster, right? So the poster should first thing attract attention because, you know, it's a room full of posters. There's probably maybe in some conferences, hundreds of posters. Right. So the first thing is that you need to stand out. So the way you achieve that is by having one key large visual that is related to your research. Let's say if your research is on, let's say the, you know, bone structure, chemistry, have a large bone, something that is recognizable from the other side of the room. Ah, so a big visual. One key big visual that will make your poster stand out from the other side of the room. People will notice it, get curious, walk towards you and then start the conversation. The goal is not to have to watch people read your poster. The goal is to quickly walk them through the story in one in a one minute spill and then ask a question and start conversation, which is supposed to go two ways. Right. And that's how good networking is supposed to be. So bottom line is that a poster is an, an eye catcher first and a conversation starter second so that's what it's supposed to be um to achieve that we need to slash the amount of content we put on our posters that's the the key thing that will dra dramatically improve even without getting into graphic design principles if you just cut the content in half you you do you improve your poster massively because everyone is making the same mistake having way too much on it I definitely made that mistake, yeah. <laughs> it, it, look, we are all guilty, but in a way we're not because we don't know any better. Like researchers don't get any training on this. And that's that's why I want to change this. I, I, that's why I am providing training on scientific posters in the uh, form of you workshops and, and online courses because literally... I couldn't find any training on this. And, you know, I was lucky to have this background in graphic design, but 99.9 .9 of researchers don't. Right. So we need to at least spend a couple of hours 
learning how we should design an effective poster before we go to the first conference and then get disappointed because, oh, nobody came to talk to me. Uh, people were not really interested in my poster. Nobody really noticed it. I don't have any contacts from this conference. I think it was a waste of time and money. That's not the kind of experience you want. It should be the opposite. <laughs> you should be full of people that want to talk to you, having lots of new contacts uh, to thrive in your career. That's the whole goal of, of a, a poster session. And so and I guess that's why your course is called how to design an award-winning poster. So this isn't just a poster that's going to do well for your research. It's a poster that's going to capture that attention. So you can really meet people who are interested in it, interested in what you're doing. I just love that. Yes. Uh, and ideally you, your poster should work for a broad audience, not just technical audience, you know? So it, it, it depends on where you set the bar. But let's say for most scientific conferences, it's a technical audience and that's fine. Um, so something else, uh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, we were talking about different uses for posters. What is a good poster that you could make for a general audience? Okay, well, for general audience, you the key thing is keeping jargon in check. Mm. Because if you're not an expert um, and you don't, you're not familiar with the jargon on something, um, one jargony word, okay, two, mm, on the third one, you're like, this is not for me. I feel mm -hmm. stupid. And you switch off and you stop reading and you lost the person. It, it's, it's just how it goes. So if you want to reach a broader audience with your poster, definitely keep the jargon in check and it's better to have a few extra words, but to explain a concept rather than just relying on, on jargon. Um, other than that, then you cannot assume people will be able to understand complex charts, like three-dimensional plots, forget about it. Like bar charts, fine. Most people can, can understand a bar chart, um, but forget about all the more complex things. Um, like three-dimensional plots, which is very common in some disciplines, um, or some, you know, crazy charts like in evolutionary biology or genetics, which look so complicated. Mm. Um, you know, if that those are your visuals, you should really rethink uh, how you present your, your data visually for for a broader audience. Yeah. Mm, great but advice. if you're talking, if you go to a, you know, a genetics conference and uh, there's just uh, hundreds of geneticists around <laughs> you, then go for it. That's fine. It's, then, then the jargon will make sense to them. Then the jargon will make sense. Then <laughs> yeah. the complex genetics chart will make sense too. And then it's fine. So it, it, the, the first thing is always to ask yourself, who am I talking to? Who am I presenting to? Mm -hmm. And once you've got clarity on that, then you that sets the bar the bar for your communication. Well, I think that's wonderful. I really enjoy talking to you about this because I think that visuals are so important for researchers in all fields, not just scientists, but um, everyone who's working on something that maybe a limited audience is going to be able to read that kind of final product. It can really help to talk about it online, whether you're embedding a video on your website or sharing it on social media, there's potential to reach way more people than most researchers expect um, with that kind of visual. So I just have enjoyed this conversation so much. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Oh, well, look, I could talk about this stuff for hours. <laughs> <laughs> so something I wanted to add is that, yes, we have this online course um, on our website called How to Design an Award-Winning Scientific Poster. But we also have plenty of free resources on our blog, uh, including some poster templates, which many researchers find really handy. Um, so feel free to visit our website if you can dig into the resources section on the blog there's plenty of very well written valuable materials for free but then if you're interested in really going deep I recommend our online course 
Well, I am so excited to share your course with people. I hope that if you're working on a scientific poster, you check it out because I think that having that ability to reach more people can really affect how you feel about your research. It can well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Jennifer. Check out Tulio on social media. Um, and thank you so much for listening to The Social Academic.